Hello everyone and welcome to the first of our video tutorials on offer and acceptance in contract law. Today we're going to be looking at offer and in a later video tutorial we'll be looking at acceptance. Contractual agreement has traditionally been analysed in terms of offer and acceptance. What happens is that one party, the offeror, makes an offer which once accepted by another party, the offeree, creates a binding contract. Before we look at a definition of an offer, it's important that you understand um, the key types of contract that we're going to encounter. You need to be aware of the difference between bilateral and unilateral contracts. In a unilateral contract, the clue is in the name here, uni, meaning one, so it's one-sided. In a unilateral contract, the promisor makes an open promise to provide something in exchange for performance. So classic example here would be a promise to reward anybody who finds a lost wallet. Whereas with a bilateral contract, the ones that we're going to encounter most in contract law, um, in a bilateral contract, both the promisor and the promisee knowingly enter into an agreement where both parties make a promise and each is obligated to fulfil that promise. So classically, in a contract for the sale of goods, the, bu the buyer promises to pay the price and the seller promises to deliver the goods. So that's two way. We'll have a look at a case on unilateral contracts um, later in this video, which will help to illustrate this further. So let's start having a look um, at what an offer is then. So an offer is an expression of willingness to contract on certain terms, and it's made with the intention that it will become binding once it has been accepted. And there's a key concept that you need to be aware of when you first start looking at what an offer is. And that's shown here on the next slide, invitation to treat. And we have come across this phrase before in first year law. So if you cast your minds back to statutory interpretation, when you looked at the literal rule, you looked at the case of Fisher and Bell. And we're going to look at that case again today. But in Fisher and Bell, we came across the fact that he was selling knives and they were held not to be an offer, but an invitation to treat. So an invitation to treat is not an offer. And this is the first concept that you've really got to get your head around in contract law. And this seems quite confusing um, to most people, that when you see goods displayed on supermarket shelves, most people, the general public, would probably think they were being offered to be sold. But technically in contract law, things that are on a shelf are not offers, they are what we call invitations to treat. On this slide here, I'm going to try and clarify that a little bit. So supermarkets and invitations to treat. So when you see something on a shelf that you want to buy, so for me, wine. So I see wine on a shelf, that's an invitation to treat. When I pick that wine up and take it to the cashier, I then, as the customer, make the offer and the cashier, when they take my money, they accept my offer to buy it. And at that point, there is a valid contract. The key difference here, an offer can be accepted and leads to a binding contract, whereas an invitation to treat is like the first stage before you've got an offer. So this can't be accepted. OK, this is an invitation for the customer to make an offer. And this is quite logical when you think about it. So if we come back to the wine example, when the wine is on a supermarket shelf, that's an invitation to treat. It's important that I make the offer and that I don't accept this at that point because the shop has the right to refuse to sell me the wine. So if, for example, I was underage or I was really drunk or something like that, the shop can refuse to serve me. So I make the offer to buy it. They have a look at me, see that I'm old enough and they accept my offer. So there is a very practical reason why things on a shelf are classed as an invitation to treat and not an offer. So the shelf is an invitation to treat. The customer makes the offer. The shop accepts it. 
And I put this little meme here um, to draw your attention to quite an important point that it doesn't matter what the phrasing is in the shop. So things might say, uh, quote, special offer. Although the shop will call it an offer, we as contract lawyers know it's really a special invitation to treat and we make the offer uh, to buy it. As I previously mentioned, that rule on invitations to treat comes from the case of Fisher and Bell, which you've seen before, where a shopkeeper had a flick knife in his window with a price tag attached. And um, the issue was, was this in conflict with the Offensive Weapons Act of 1959, which was trying to prevent shops from selling knives? And the words that had to be interpreted were it was an offence for it to be an offer for sale. Now, most of the public would see um, a price tag attached and think, well, yeah, that is an offer. He is offering it for sale. However, we as contract lawyers know that the flip knife with the price tag on is not an offer for, for sale. It's merely an invitation to treat. And then I, the customer, make the offer to buy it when I pick it up. That was um, an absurd decision when we looked at the literal rule, of course. Um, it was just that Parliament used the wrong wording when they were saying offer for sale. The reason that's absurd, absurd, of course, is because the shopkeeper could never be guilty of offering it for sale. It would actually be the customer who was guilty for making an offer when they um, said that they were happy to buy it. Similarly, in Partridge and Cretendon, there was an advertisement this time um, in a newspaper. You can see it was a while ago, so we've got shillings here. Um, Bramble Finches, 25 shillings each. That was what was written in the newspaper. And that was held to be an invitation to treat, not an offer. So when you see that advert, that's inviting you to make an offer which the person selling the Bramble Finches can then accept or reject. So things on supermarket shelves are invitations to treat. Adverts in newspapers or on eBay, they are going to be invitations to treat. There is a slight exception to this. Advertisements are generally invitations to treat, as I've just said, with Partridge and Crutendon. However, in some instances, an advert can amount to an offer. And this is where we come back to the concept of a unilateral contract. So this is a very famous case here, Carlyle and the Carbolic Smoke Ball. And you can see it's an ancient case from 1893. And I've actually included here on the slide for you the original um, poster um, that this case relates to see from the facts here that our defendants um, advertised that they would pay a £100 reward to any purchaser who used the smoke ball um, and still got the flu. So remember, this is an ancient case. The idea was that if you used this smoke ball, um, you wouldn't get the flu. And they've said here that they've deposited £1,000 in the bank to pay anyone who does use it and still gets the flu. Now, our claimant bought it, got the flu, and wanted to claim his £100 reward. The defendants argued that following, you know, a case, I suppose, like Partridge and Cretendon, um, that advertisements are generally invitations to treat, and that they couldn't contract with the whole world. They didn't want to pay this reward. However, the court held that a promise to pay a reward, like they'd done here, can be an offer if the wording shows that they had an intention to be bound. And the court said that the fact that they said £1,000 was deposited in the bank showed that they intended to be bound by this. So this is showing that an advert can be an offer which you can accept by following the instructions. But I would say that's the exception generally for us um, adverts are going to be invitations to treat. But if we have clear wording like we did here, then it can be an offer which you can accept. And that's why if you see rewards, um, if it's got clear wording about money you'll receive, um, you would be accepting that offer.
special uh, situations to consider now in terms of offers. So firstly, auctions. So where an auction takes place, um, each bid is an offer which is then accepted um, when the hammer falls, uh, when the auctioneer accepts it. So in an auction, these are all offers and the acceptance happens when the hammer falls. Situation to consider here is requests for tenders. So sometimes um, a company will request parties to bid um, and that's what we saw in the Harvella case here. So the Royal Trust of Canada invited two parties to bid for some land and they said um, that the highest bid would be accepted. So Sir Leonard bid $2.1 million or £100,000 more than any other offer. Um, and the Royal Trust of Canada accepted this offer, but Harvella sued. They thought that was very unfair, this referential bid here. Um, they'd offered $2.175 million. Now, the important issue for us is that the invitation to tender, so when a company says, make me tenders, make me bids, um, that's an invitation to treat. And it is the company who makes the offer, offer of 2.1, offer of 2.175, which the company can then accept. So that's the first important thing from uh, this case. It also told us that referential bids are ineffective. So where Sir Leonard rather cheekily said that he would pay um, that much money or £100,000 more, that's not allowed. OK, in contract law, you can't have a referential bid. You can't say I'll pay you £10 or 50p more than whatever the other party says, because that's unfair. Um, so that's the situation with tenders. You've also got to be careful with offers that a statement of price is not mistaken as being an offer. And this is shown with the ancient case of Harvey and Facey from 1893. So Harvey telegraphed Facey, will you send sellers bumper hall pen, um, telegraph lowest cash price. Facey then replied, lowest cash 900. Harvey then responded, we agree to buy bumper hall pen for the 900 asked for by you. But what the court said was that Facey's telegram saying lowest cash 900 was an invitation to treat. That was not an offer which could immediately be accepted. That was merely a statement of the minimum price they would ever consider. So they're saying that's the lowest we'd consider. Basically, you make me an offer. So you've got to be very careful to distinguish is your character saying an offer which they want to be accepted or are they merely giving some information? It's quite logical that the offer must be communicated to the offeree. That's illustrated by Taylor and Lerd. Um, and you can see here that Taylor decided that he was going to step down as captain in this case um, and work just as a normal crew member. But he hadn't told his bosses that that's what he was going to do. He hadn't offered um, to step down and to, to do the other job. So in order for an offer to be accepted, of course, you must be aware of it. The terms of the offer must be certain. So you can't make vague statements like um, I'll give you an extra five pounds if the horse is, quote, lucky for me, um, because, you know, what's lucky? That's subjective. So all terms must be certain for them to be an offer. Um, another important point is that an offer can be revoked. That means withdrawn or taken back at any time until it's accepted. Once it's accepted, you can't take it back, but you can take it back any time before it's accepted. And that's illustrated by Routledge and Grant. If you are revoking your offer, though, you have to make sure that you've communicated the fact that you're revoking it, you're withdrawing it to the other party. You can't just decide you're revoking it in your mind. You have to actually communicate that. And that's from Byrne and T and Hoven. An offer will eventually lapse um, when a period of time passes. So an offer won't stay open forever if nothing happens, if no one responds. So where an offer hasn't been accepted, but it's not been formally withdrawn either, it will eventually lapse after a reasonable amount of time 
depending on what, what the offer was about. Finally, Bradbury and Morgan, in general, an offer can't be accepted after the offeror has died.